So uh, I'll hand over to Dr. DeCosta, who's going to talk to us about um, ageing and uh, traumatic brain injury. So after the wonderful presentations from uh, Professor Hutchinson and uh, uh, the robotic rehabilitation, um, I'm going to talk about an area that actually um, we still have a lot of questions. And one of the reasons is that traditionally um, old people, particularly very elderly, have been excluded from um, studies uh, because of their complex um, health issues. So we often don't know what the right treatments are for this group. Um, I, I've been privileged to work within the uh, major trauma pathway over the last uh, five years or so since uh, Sheffield uh, became a major trauma centre. And one of the real positives I've taken from that, I, prior to that I was not a great believer in pathways, um, but one of the things that it was very, very successful at is bringing together a group of specialists, um, medical therapists, specialist nurses, to oversee the care of severely injured people, whatever their age, and giving us the opportunity to discuss face-to-face -face, um, the correct um, pathway for that individual be it to go to neurosurgery, to cardiothoracic medicine. Um, in prior days as a consultant, if you um, fell down the stairs um, and ended up with a severe Britain injury or a severe chest injury, if you were aged 50, you'd be admitted under the uh, specialty uh, where your major injury lay. If you were 85, um, you'd end up um, under the care of a, a geriatric uh, medicine physician who didn't have any specific training uh, in trauma um, and one was then trying to collate the um, information and arrive at a, uh, a proper uh, plan of care for that individual and the advent of the uh, major trauma pathway has made a very great difference uh, to those um, people. So why, why do we think it's important? So we're seeing what is um, being described as a silver epidemic. And um, I'll just give you a background from a number of studies. Uh, so an Australian survey uh, looking at their uh, incidence of um, traumatic brain injury between 1998 and 2011 uh, showed an increase of about 7% per annum, which doesn't sound a lot uh, until you look at the um, um, number of people admitted to hospital be between the start of the study and the end of the study, which had trebled. Uh, and that has continued um, since that time. Um, the biggest finding there was uh, subdural hematoma on CT scanning, uh, concussion affected about a quarter, and traumatic subarachnoid uh, a smaller proportion um, and the big change that they had seen in that period was a move from uh, motor vehicle accidents to uh, falls uh, as the uh, cause of those. Overall there's a, a mortality of about 13%, so one in eight people who um, had that diagnosis unfortunately succumbed. Um, mainly men but in the over 80 group uh, there was a great, a great proportion of uh, women, uh, probably related to the demographic change. Men t tend to die quite a few years earlier than um, their, their uh, partners. Um, that was paralleled uh, in a study uh, from the University of Warwick, again a single institution rather than uh, the Australian studies which looked at all of New South Wales. Um, but they, they had a look back uh, using their TARN network uh, data, that's the trauma and research um, network, sorry, trauma audit and research network. Uh, and what they saw was um, that about a third of the people admitted uh, through that pathway uh, were over 65, and about 40%, um, 624 uh, of the older uh, admissions had 
traumatic brain injury out of a total number of uh, just under 1,400. And in that group, the major cause uh, was falls. Um, a preponderance of men, um, but a fairly severe um, category using the Mayo criteria. Um, surprisingly, uh, they found that 57% had a, a good outcome on discharge, uh, but a quite significant mortality, particularly in the over 85s. So we're seeing that falls are a really major cause of mortality in this group. What they didn't discuss um, is what the um, underlying causes of that mortality were, whether they were primarily the injury or whether there were complications of pre-existing medical conditions. Um, interestingly, in that study, only um, a third of, sorry, two-thirds of the falls were in their own home, and a rather smaller uh, proportion had occurred in the institution. Now, that actually included in hospital falls because those patients would be reported through the TARN uh, network. Um, surgical intervention was relatively low um, in that uh, about 90 uh, patients had undergone uh, neurosurgery um, and more than half of those were actually burr hole drainages of subdural hematomas and that was out of about 280 uh, patients who had subdural hematomas. Um, Extradural was relatively uncommon in that um, study, uh, and I'll touch on briefly some reasons why that might uh, be the case. Um, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, appeared more common, and that might be related to uh, increased numbers of uh, patients being scanned during that period of time uh, because of the uh, advent of guidelines uh, regarding um, who should and shouldn't have a scan. So what's the underlying pathology there? So there's a number of physiological region, reasons why uh, older people fall. Um, there's a decline of balance, uh, slowing down of reflexes, um, and reduced muscle strength and power. So I'm 65. I know now that if I uh, catch my foot when I'm walking the dog on the pavement, uh, I'm more likely to stagger rather than immediately recovering uh, my um, uh, balance. And very embarrassingly, on one occasion, I uh, fell headlong when he wrapped the lead around my legs. Uh, so that's something that none of us um, can avoid. Um, we can try and defer it. Um, interestingly, studies in older people have looked at trying to improve balance and uh, coordination. The only one that's actually been shown to work is Tai Chi. Um, there's some interest in yoga as well, um, and, but uh, things that you'd expect intuitively would work, like exercise programs, haven't shown the uh, benefits, and that's perhaps because we're focusing on high-risk groups of individuals who've already experienced um, some irreversible changes, and it may be different if we look prospectively at improving fitness and balance in uh, a slightly earlier stage of aging. Um, what are the pathological changes that we see in the brain? Well, um, the dura becomes more adherent um, as um, people get older to the interior of the skull. Um, cerebral atrophy is very common and that might have some uh, contribution to vulnerability of the bridging veins. Um, so when you fall, um, you get a degree of shear stress as well as sometimes direct uh, coup and contra-coup um, injuries. And one of the striking things uh, in my practice uh, that I see is how individuals who've um, sustained significant uh, head injuries, falling from a standing height, hitting the head, will get a, a very acute subdural hematoma within uh, one or two hours, uh, which is life-threatening. Uh, often, we'll see people who um, have a relatively minor injury. I think the 
least uh, significant injury I've ever come across is someone who was running a football a group for older men aged 65 plus who ran into one of the other uh, players and got a subdural from that. Um, and there's been an explosion of anticoagulation uh, in the last 15 years, um, largely due to um, increased detection of atrial fibrillation. And uh, whilst many people previously were reluctant to go on to uh, warfarin, uh, the new direct-acting oral anticoagulants um, are much easier for both uh, primary care and patients to, to manage. So we're seeing many more older people on um, anticoagulants. Um, so risk factors for falling, well, visual impairments, very common. Um, and that includes actually, um, even with corrective spectacles, when I moved to having very focals, uh, I really struggled uh, walking downstairs and once or twice ended up tripping on the bottom stair. Um, and that's just something we forget about um, trying to improve. Uh, I think therapy colleagues are very, very good about looking at um, the, the environment, making sure that there's proper lighting and, and so forth. I think as doctors, we're actually quite poor at checking those things when someone presents either to primary care or, or to secondary care with falls. Um, cognitive impairment and dementia are a very big contributing factor um, because people with those conditions will often put themselves in um, positions of danger um, in, in the sense of falling um, without having a, a proper understanding of that. And the group that we particularly see, um, which is very common now in hospital, is people with delirium. Um, frailty also, probably because of its effect on um, muscle strength and sarcopenia, um, is uh, a common cause. One we forget about is alcohol uh, consumption. There's quite a lot of particularly older men who have a significant alcohol consumption, which can contrib contribute to their falls. Um, Depression's a risk factor for falling. I've never quite worked out why, other than perhaps medical treatment. But working within the trauma pathway, I'm beginning to see um, older men who have actually jumped off uh, the top of their garage or out of a first floor window uh, as a suicide attempt, as well as sort of more um, damaging from, from a bridge. Uh, in the States, they tend to see more in the way of... Uh, uh, gunshot wounds because uh, guns are so much more freely available. And then the other issue is there's a wide range of medical conditions which contribute to the comorbidity and probably to the recovery from the traumatic brain injury. So what about um, the US? So there's a very high risk of... Uh, if you have a high risk of falls, you have about a 1 in 30 chance of falling each year um, and the group we sometimes forget about is the recreational ones uh, so in America skiing is quite a common cause of TBI uh, in this country we're seeing more and more uh, cyclists uh, and it, it certainly put me off cycling down roads because every morning there's somebody else who's been knocked off their bike but uh, I uh, certainly wouldn't discourage people from cycling, just try and avoid the cars. Um, the mechanisms in the States, uh, falls more commonly will cause um, mass lesions, uh, of which uh, Professor Hutchinson has talked, and uh, vehicle accidents, more commonly axonal injury. If you look at over, over 65s, they quote a prevalence of about 40% of people having um, experienced a, a traumatic brain injury. Um, I'm not sure that um, would be our experience over here, and it may just be related to how they classify uh, those. Uh, but the emergency department incidence is that one in 50 
of people over 75 and one in, sorry, 200 of uh, over 65s will be admitted with a traumatic brain injury. Uh, again, the majority of those are due to falls. And there's a very common attendance at the US. 8% uh, of adults uh, will attend an ED with a falls-related injury uh, each year. Again, I'm not sure if um, that's quite as high in this country. Um, they quote a relatively low uh, admission rate of falls if you are admitted to hospital um, of 1.5 falls per bed per year. Um, looking at hospital experience, most wards will experience about 40 falls per month. Uh, and to me, that's sort of the real epidemic, um, which is causing both hip fracture and um, brain injury. And, and that's the group that um, I think may well be coming to Beth and her colleagues. Um, what about the presenting clinical features? Uh, so we've mentioned those in the American studies. CT findings, extradural hemorrhage less common. Uh, the commonest finding is subdural hematoma and midline shift. Um, one of the uh, ways in which older people differ uh, from the younger person with, with a, a brain injury is that the GCS seems to underestimate uh, the severity of the injury. So it can be often uh, normal or only slightly reduced. Um, looking at people over 65 with uh, a GCS of between 13 and 15, um, up to 20% would have a CT finding of an intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and that, as uh, Professor Hutchinson alluded to, uh, led to a modification of the NICE uh, recommendations. Um, quite worryingly, um, in a Swedish study, when they looked at individuals who'd actually had a diagnosed um, intracranial hemorrhage, almost three-fifths of that group um, had a GCS that was normal uh, on admission. So there's some question about whether the GCS is as sensitive, uh, particularly in the very elderly, because of the um, increased space uh, left by cerebral atrophy. Uh, and we've mentioned the, the NICE guidelines previously. What about anticoagulant treatment? Um, so one of the um, significant things that we've seen in clinical practice is that when we, just anecdotally, when we see patients with um, a brain injury who are on anticoagulation, the size of the contusional hemorrhage or the size of the subdural hematoma seems very much larger. Um, and these things do predict uh, the potential outcome. Uh, studies suggest that if you reverse that uh, rapidly, then being on the anticoagulant doesn't uh, affect the outcome separately from those previous predictors of the GCS and uh, hematoma volume. Reversal is becoming a bigger issue. So with vitamin K antagonists, we would traditionally reverse uh, with um, vitamin uh, K, which takes about 12 hours to work, and um, prothrombin factor concentrate, which works almost immediately. But there is a practical issue. Um, many emergency departments don't actually carry uh, the uh, prothrombin concentrate as a stock drug. It has to be authorised by uh, a haematology department who sometimes want to see the um, clotting uh, ratios before they actually prescribe the drug. So that throws an immediate delay into the system. And then once you've uh, had that authorised, you've got to go and get it from the pharmacy, reconstitute it. And on more than one occasion, um, we've brought the drug back up to the admissions unit and... Um, no one's been willing to give it, and I've had to reconstitute and give it myself. 
Uh, so there are a lo lot of potential um, delays. Uh, one particular case that I'm dealing with um, not in stroke uh, took about 12 hours before the um, uh, fa factor concentrate was actually administered. So although the treatment was uh, prescribed and correct, there's just a huge delay in administration. Reversal of the DOAX is a bit more controversial. Um, there are now um, a, a direct reversal agent for rivaroxaban, which is hugely expensive, uh, and there's been one for dibigotran, which works in a slightly different way for some time. Uh, but generally, uh, what we've given is the um, prothrombin factor concentrate. That's worrying because you can't actually monitor easily. You can measure the factor 10A levels, but you can't easily monitor the effect on the coagulation. But the Verona study was reassuring um, in that the initial rate of intracranial hemorrhage um, was half that in the patients who were taking DOAX, uh, but also that after the reversal treatment, uh, there was no significant difference in the number of late bleeds, which was about 2, two to 3 percent in both groups. So certainly the jury seems to be in favour of administering a DOAC um, for anticoagulation in older patients at risk of falls. Uh, the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage um, compared to the number of falls is about one in 300. So it's a relatively uncommon uh, consequence of falling. Um, we've talked about the early management. So monitoring of the uh, GCS uh, may not be as sensitive as in younger uh, patients. Uh, one of the tricky areas is in uh, patients who have dementia, who because of their um, confusion uh, may already have a slight reduction in their GCS um, and equally present more frequently uh, to the A&E department. And this also applies to patients with stroke. Uh, biomarkers have been licensed by the FDA, uh, not used in this country. Again, they're validated more in the under 65 population than in uh, the older group. So we're not um, sure whether that will actually contribute uh, to the management of um, head injury uh, in this country. Um, Professor Hutchinson talked about uh, intracranial pressure monitoring. Um, pragmatically, studies have predominantly included younger individuals uh, with brain injury. And as you age, uh, your intracranial pressure drops a bit and your cerebral perfusion pressure uh, rises, which are both uh, factors that would uh, delay uh, intervention and we don't have um, sensitive ways of measuring uh, th the effects of, of any pressure change uh, although we've heard of the new uh, three probe measurements that um, they're using in Cambridge. So as yet um, guidelines are, are difficult to formulate for this much older group who have a significant mortality. Um, one of the issues that we've seen um, traditionally is that we as physicians are much more reluctant to um, refer our uh, older patients uh, for intensive uh, neurosurgical management, um, partly because to that, us that equated major surgery, but it might also include um, intensive monitoring and all the other um, uh, interventions that uh, Professor Hutchinson described short of um, craniectomy. Um, on a pragmatic note, uh, what they noted um, in Oslo 
was that there was um, a much lower rate of evacuation in the over 75s, uh, almost uh, half compared to uh, people under 65. Uh, the mortality was approximately double, but they questioned whether part of that might be related to the choice of treatments um, rather than necessarily underlying um, worse outcomes. And what we don't have is large randomized studies of intervention uh, off various levels in that older group, although uh, those are in uh, progress. Um, we've heard uh, about surgery. Um, burr hole drainage uh, was um, a, a major part of our consideration in uh, older people's care. Um, but usually that would be delivered um, 10 to 14 days after the uh, development when the clot had actually dissolved and it was much easier to drain and wash out. Um, dealing with an acute subdural, a large um, lump of blood over the uh, cerebral cortex uh, requires a much bigger operation. And what we're less good at is, so, and have little evidence for, is selecting those individuals who might uh, benefit even at much older age. Uh, we do have a concept of biological aging, um, but we're, we're often not very good at um, uh, judging that. Uh, the prognosis does appear to be worse in older patients um, and complications are much, much more common uh, in that group. Um, so what are the effects? Well, the CDC uh, estimate that about a quarter of um, the uh, severe TBI population have each of the outcomes. So about a quarter die from it, about a quarter are worse, a quarter are probably no different at a year uh, from when they're discharged from hospital, and about a quarter are a bit better. Anxiety and depression are very common, uh, and that might require antidepressant um, introduction. That's got a risk of its own in that that increases your risk of hemorrhagic stroke. Um, the big effect we see uh, is a, a massive impact on cognition, often even in individuals who don't have uh, very large hemorrhages or even very trivial um, bleeds. And that's probably because we underestimate um, axonal injury because we're not doing MRIs on those individuals. Personality change is a very difficult thing to deal with for, for families. Um, Seizures can become important, uh, 50 times more likely to happen after a TBI, um, and in older people often present late. Um, infections uh, are more common, uh, probably in the more immobile individual, and pneumonia is a, uh, a very significant threat. And about 50% will have moderate to severe disability. What about the long term? So if you had one uh, major head injury, major traumatic brain injury, you've got about a three in 100 chance of having another in the next year. Uh, longer term, it can lead to an increased uh, risk of Parkinson's and dementia. Um, it's not quite clear whether that's chicken or egg. So in a Swedish study, um, looking at people three months after TBI, uh, there was very significant uh, cognitive impairment uh, and new cases of Parkinson's detected. Um, it's difficult to separate with the uh, cognitive impairment the um, effect of the uh, TBI. Uh, but later on, uh, it can double your risk of developing dementia. It's clear that if you've got preceding uh, functional impairment, uh, 
that that will affect uh, your outcome. Um, what's interesting is one study of um, an incidental finding from patients with multiple system atrophy, which is a degenerative brain disease, um, and as an incidental finding, eight out of 136 people had uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which they attributed to recurrent falls uh, in that group. And it may be that some uh, individuals with um, multiple falls go on to develop some of these pathological changes. One of the difficult things to separate, um, I think, in your practice in old patients is whether the age decline is attributable to the, sorry, the cognitive decline is attributable to the uh, TBI or whether uh, it's a consequence of aging. And that's less so, I think, if you've got a, a pre-existing um, condition um, that could, might cause cognitive impairment. You've got some baseline to measure against and there is an increasing database uh, which al allows you to estimate um, the rate of decline uh, that you expect. Um, one of the major questions we have both in stroke and uh, traumatic brain injury is do we restart anticoagulation? Um, there are alternatives in stroke because um, there are various therapies that you can employ to reduce the risk of cerebral embolism, uh, but those haven't been um, tested in um, TBI uh, patients to the same degree. What we do know um, is that if you restart your anticoagulation, you've got about a 50% increased risk of having a hemorrhagic complication in the year after you restart. Um, and uh, that's set against a smaller reduction in thrombotic complications if you stop uh, your anticoagulation. We're currently looking in stroke um, at uh, the safety of restarting anticoagulation in individuals who've had a, a, a cerebral hemorrhage, but that's a different um, question because it's a spontaneous hemorrhage. Um, and I think the case is still out, uh, but I think there will undoubtedly be a fair amount of litigation uh, in the future uh, where patients stop um, anticoagulation because of either the risk of falls or a minor uh, traumatic brain injury and subsequently have uh, an ischemic stroke. So, um, in, in conclusion, um, we're seeing an increasing incidence and I think that will continue uh, as our population demographic becomes older. Um, they're both life-threatening and if you survive, they're life-shortening events. They result in very significant um, physical and cognitive impairment and people who survive um, experience both a reduction in their quality of life and disability. The, there's a lack of evidence in the older group of patients, the over 75s, to um, advise us on how exactly we should manage uh, these uh, individuals when they sustain a, a traumatic brain injury. And one of the issues which um, we have both in traumatic brain injury and in neurorehabilitation in general is the role of longer term rehabilitation. When I started as a consultant, um, we would regularly follow up straight patients for uh, four or five years after their event um, to make sure that they remained at the or near the baseline uh, that um, they'd achieved. And when commissioning became 
much stricter, uh, that was uh, stopped and we currently have more intensive um, hospital and community physiotherapy to six months after stroke, but then very dubious services thereafter. Um, and I, I do acknowledge uh, Professor O'Connor's uh, <laughs> guideline uh, that, that with a very finite resource, um, we have to front load um, the areas such as stroke um, because we don't have uh, enough staff to provide um, long-term rehabilitation across both uh, neurorehabilitation and musculoskeletal, let alone the others. Um, so I'll, I'll probably stop there and um, uh, take some, qu some questions. Thank you.